Well, hello everyone, it's Jess Hartz and welcome back to the Edith Finch House Part 2. I'm going to be jumping right back into the video, so get ready. As Edith makes her way to the family cemetery, she talks about how death has been in their family for so long, they must just be used to it. And asking what kind of family finishes building the cemetery before starting on the house. There's even a pet cemetery with over a dozen pets buried. Not to mention the birds Edie has in her room. They really like to memorialise the dead in this family. And to an extent, I'm fine with that. I'm very much a let's remember our dead person and respect them. Do what they want it. But when it comes to the point where it becomes toxic like this, that's when there's an issue. Edith moves on to the rest of the cemetery where she finds Edie and Sven's tombstone. Sven has a saw made out of metal cut into stone and Edie has a book. What I found interesting about that is she didn't get a painting monument. Why a book? Because she liked telling stories? Molly had a cat with angelic wings. Calvin had a rocket with a moon. Walter has a rock with a hole in it. And when you press yourself close to the hole, it shows a tiny man looking out from a tunnel. Edith believes it was definitely Edie's idea to make a massive monument for Odin. Edith's mother, Dawn, always wanted to move on, but for Edie, the past never went away. And for real, it'd be difficult considering she made sure her bedroom was directly facing the sunken wreck that was her old house. Even right next to Odin's monument, there is a telescope that lets you gaze out at the old house. Some people don't move on, unfortunately. We begin to walk downwards to a different section of the cemetery where Sam, Gus and Gregory are buried. Edith begins to say Edie's side was always easier for me to understand, but the older I get, the more I can see where my mum was coming from. There is something to be said about letting go of the past to move on with the future. Sometimes it's so difficult to let go of the ones you loved, but in the end it gives us the ability to live on. And that's probably what they want. Edith then climbs up to a treehouse and walks precariously down a branch onto the roof of the house. And whilst doing this, she states, If she knew there was so much climbing, she wouldn't have came here at 22 weeks pregnant. Which once again, suggests a lot of the finches were risk takers, prone to injury. But remember that person at the beginning, readeth Edith's journal on the boat? It all connects now. And remember how they had a cast on their hand? Very prone to injury, like I said. She makes it up to the small balcony outside Sam's room and makes her way inside. Sam's room is filled with old hunting and military memorabilia, with lots and lots of photos as well as a tripod for his camera. Once again, Edie has painted his portrait and decorated his space with an astronaut, maybe to symbolise his brother, a camera and a wedding ring. When Edith opens a yellow envelope, we dive into Sam's story. It's Dawn, Edith's mother as a child, and Sam on a hunting trip. We play as Sam at first taking photos of Dawn, most of which are of her with her nose buried in a book. Each time we take a photo, the scene transitions. The relationship seems pure and lovely, even to the point where... When we switch to Dawn, she takes a funny photo of her dad going for a wee by a tree. Sam is teaching Dawn how to hunt because he wants her to learn how to survive. Sam says how he hadn't even been out to this location in 20 years and the last time was with his brother Calvin. It goes to a scene where Sam is helping Dawn shoot a stag. When she manages to shoot the stag reluctantly, it changes to a scene to Sam in front of the camera with Dawn off in the distance crying over the stag's body. Might I add, this is also on a steep as heck cliff, a pretty dangerous place to take a photo, with or without a stag. We walk up to Dawn as Sam and we pick up the antlers to get a good photo, but Dawn says how it's still twitching. When the timer for the camera goes off, the stag jumps up, still alive, and Sam gets knocked off the cliff to his death. This was entirely avoidable. Not some curse, just reckless. Why wouldn't you move the stag and check if it was dead first? But I guess as a young end say, anything for the gram. We move back to Edith as she draws Sam into a journal, as she wishes her mum told her the story. She makes her way through a secret passageway down to where Dawn, Gus and Gregory used to have a bedroom together. Dawn's bed is completely empty, Gregory has a cot and Gus has his bed. When we look into Gregory's cot, we see how Edie's painted his portrait along with a heap of toys. This part I will put a little trigger warning, we all know what the portrait means, yes a baby dies in this game, this part is extremely sad. We pick up a divorce contract between Sam and Kay and it reads, Dear Kay, do you remember the way Gregory used to laugh when he thought he was alone, like something funny was happening, but only he could see it. 
We delve into Gregory's story. He's in his bathtub having a jolly good time with his toy frog. Some grandiose music is playing and the overall tone is uplifting. But we know what's coming and while Sam is narrating the scene, it has a somber undertone. We control the frog swimming around the bathtub as Kay comes in with the intention of unplugging the bathtub. But the phone begins to ring, so she buggers off to the other room to answer it, leaving Gregory alone to play. She is on the phone with Sam and is and obviously not wanting to talk with him. But whilst this is happening, we're jumping around as a toy frog, popping imaginary bubbles with rubber duckies inside. Quite the imagination. As Sam narrates, he wonders what Gregory's world was like. As we knock all the toys into the bathtub, we also knock some bubble bath solution into the tub and it becomes a whole party. As Sam narrates, he worries that Gregory was too happy for a baby, but that he could feel him slipping away. Kay comes back in and plugs it and unplugs the bathtub. Sam goes on to say how things might have been different if he didn't call that night. He calls again and Kay says how she doesn't want Gregory to hear this, so she once again buggers off, whilst Gregory, with the bathtub door shut, turns the water back on with the toy frog. The music gets louder and the water rises. Now Gregory is swimming through the water. It's changed into this the ocean theme. He swims through the kelp with all his toys towards a plug hole. Sam says, I'm sure he was happy and he'd want you to be happy too. We swim down the plug hole and the screen goes white. Sam throughout the divorce letter states how it isn't Kay's fault, but I'm sorry, that's no curse. That's pure unadulterated carelessness on Kay's part. We knew what drowning was in the 70s. We knew not to leave a one-year-old alone in the tub. She chose to argue with Sam on the phone in a different room about their issues. She left Gregory alone in the bathtub. That's not a curse. I get so mad playing that portion of the game. Yes, I know accidents happen, but this was entirely avoidable. You don't leave a child alone in the tub, whether it's full or not. It's not safe. <sighs> okay, rant over. Edith draws Gregory's picture and we move down the beds to Gus's bed. Edie has done another portrait alongside Gus's kite rope, a picture of him flying the kite, and some studded wristbands. I think Gus and I probably would have been friends if I was a lot younger. Oh, and here's a cool as heck mohawk. <laughs> Around the kite handle we see a poem has been written for Gus by Dawn. Edith goes on to say how she could never imagine a mum writing a poem, and the poem reads, A poem for Gus, who always said the wedding was a bad idea. Our father never hit us kids, at least not very hard and it wishes us away to Gus, overlooking the ceremony on the beach, Kay and Sam's wedding. We control Gus flying his kite around the wedding. Every time Dawn finishes a line of poetry, we play as Gus sweeping up the letters with our kite. 10 points again for the solid subtitle usage. Throughout Dawn reading this, it's obvious Gus didn't want Sam to get married. He apparently says to Dawn that we don't need a stepmom. Right as the vows are overheard in the background. Sam orders Gus to come over for a photo, but as a rebellious 13 year old he is, he flips him the bird and keeps flying his kite. The weather takes a turn for the worse and we start to be able to pick up chairs and lanterns and stuff from the beach. Throw back to when we saw the chairs in those trees. Gus picks up everything with his kite, destroying the venue. Whilst everyone is inside the white wedding tent, despite the storm and the thunder, Gus continues to fly the kite. No one goes to get him to come inside. We end up picking up the wedding tent and it morphs into a jellyfish-like shape with all the chairs, lanterns and rope trailing behind it. Dawn goes on to say, I wish that I could truly say I thought about you on that day. Out there on the beach alone, just you, the wind, the sea and foam. But we didn't until we found you. As she says this, the tank comes flying down towards Gus, and from what I can deduce was that he was flying his kite, the weather went AWOL, and he was killed in the wreckage. No one thought to come for him. I can understand the mentality of the child shouldn't have been a little nuisance, but when a storm hits, all grudges be buggered, you know? Go and save your kid. Go and make sure they're safe, you know? Edith walks back and draws his picture down. As we make our way around the room we climb a rock climbing wall up to Dawn's new bedroom and it's a loft. She overlooks all the other beds. Edith says that her mum moved up there after her brothers died. She wanted to get as far away as she could. Understandable. We see how much of the smart young lady Dawn was. We also come across photos of her and Edith's father, Sanjay. Dawn had spent a summer in Calcutta building houses where she met Sanjay. I always see Dawn as like this very intellectual person and just very outgoing and smart. I really like her character to be honest, but we don't get to see much of her. 
There's a sliding screen door above Dawn's old bed where we climb a few sets of stairs up to the top of the house where Edith, Milton and Lewis used to grow herbs. After Edith's father Sanjay died, Dawn brought herself and the kids back to the house. Edith exclaims how she was sure Edie was happy to have Dawn back and to see kids around the house again. Up the top there is a classroom where Dawn used to teach Edith and Milton. For a while things were good for them. Life went on as usual, almost normal, Edith says. Behind the classroom and up the top of the house to the left, Edie built Milton, what she called the castle. That's when Edith thinks the beginning of the end happened. We crawl through the window into Edith's brother's castle slash bedroom. This is probably the plainest of all bedrooms because it's mainly all white, apart from some black paintings Milton did. And as a painter and an artist myself, I love that idea because you can just paint all the walls and start from scratch. It's cool, your whole room's a canvas. Along with some yellow footprints though, presumably belonging to Milton, go to the pulley system up to the skylight, where he did most of his painting. Little insight, a lot of the paintings on his wall were actually concept art for the game, and for the previous game Giant Sparrow did. Some mysterious and inspiring music starts playing as we venture up to the top of the Milton's castle, where a portrait of his sits along with a drawing board and candles. Atop the drawing board we see a flip book where Milton told us a story with his magic paintbrush, and in the end he makes a magic doorway where he steps into his painting and disappears. This part of the story has a lot of contention. Whatever happened to Milton? Some speculate he genuinely did make a portal to another world, which in my eyes would be what Edie would like to believe. Another one is that he just ran away, or this is just some form of weird easter egg to do with Giant Sparrow and the production team itself. But for story continuity, I believe he ran away. Hence all the newspapers Dawn organised trying to find poor Milton. Edith was four when Milton disappeared. Dawn apparently spent months searching for him and then she sealed the doors, like the rest. And we do see the actual door he painted. As Edith climbs back through the window, she says, Whatever Milton found in the house, Mum didn't want it getting out. Throughout the whole running around through the house, we see Milton's drawings, obviously saying he had been where we were before. Maybe he found out all about the history and, like Walter, he got scared or just believed the curse was coming for him, so he ran away as far as he could. All of this is, of course, speculation. We never do find out what happened to dear Milton. We walk back towards the classroom and climb up some stairs to Lewis's boat slash bedroom. As we do, Edith says how her mum blamed Edie, but Lewis blamed himself. And I'm presuming that's to do with Milton's disappearance. After Lewis graduated, he just spent more and more time in his room. Can relate. But then Dawn got him a job at a cannery. We climb through the window of the boat into Lewis's room. And this room is pretty hecking awesome. The sitar starts playing and I love the sitar. I think it's a beautiful instrument. The room is all under this kind of black light. Lewis has a gaming setup with like multiple monitors and a couple gaming systems in front of his bed. Among other things, other things that Edith remembers the smell of really well. <laughs> Lewis and Edith used to play a lot of video games together. It seems like they might have been pretty close. We see that Lewis has his high school diploma haphazardly placed above his gaming system, directly in view behind his hookah. And before we go on, another trigger warning, some sensitive stuff ahead. We find a letter from Lewis's psychiatrist and it reads, Dear Mrs. Finch, as Lewis's psychiatrist, I can understand your desire for an explanation. As I see it, the trouble began in January, shortly after we convinced your son to seek treatment for substance abuse. She goes on to say that the monotony of his daily life sober and his repetitive job at the cannery is what led him to withdraw himself into his imagination. We delve into Lewis's portion. This is my personal favourite. There is so much going on and it. it just hits me where it hurts, honestly. We play as Lewis at the cannery, where we have to use our mouse to grab the fish from the left, bring them over to the guillotine on the right so they can be decapitated. But as we go on with this, a small portion of the screen is taken up by Lewis's imagination. We control his imaginary self. He says that he started off small, walking around a labyrinth, then slowly he ima his imagination takes over. Lewis pictures himself conquering villages, becoming a hero, all along this part where we control his hero with the ASWD keys, we also have to chop the fish at the same time. And not long after, it becomes easy to multitask, but mostly we become engrossed in his imaginary world. 
This life is so much more spectacular than the one he's actually living. He begins to believe the real Lewis is the one in the story, not the one in the cannery. He believed himself to be above a king. As a psychiatrist says, for someone who'd never known success in the real world, I think it was overwhelming. My imagination is real as my body, he said to her. We reach a door where we walk through and we come to the cannery. We see him there making the same movements, chopping the fish. An amazing worker, his boss would say. Only there were no fish. It was all muscle memory. He was lost in a trance. The doctor believes Lewis was paying to remember himself as a cannery worker. She still thought she could save him, but he told her that he was to be crowned king over all the lands of wonder. We make our way up the conveyor belt and back into his daydream. The imagination takes over the whole screen and we come to his coronation, where he's made to be king by his prince or princess. The music is so uplifting and triumphant, it's amazing. We strangely see Molly the cat as the size of a small building, in the crowd of people cheering Lewis on. Through this whole sequ sequence, we also see imagery of fish everywhere. So his real life is definitely slipping through to his daydream. As he makes it to the top where he is to be made king, the psychiatrist says there was only one thing left to do, bend down his head. We move over to our prince or princess and place our head in the guillotine where they hold a crown out for us and chop. She goes on to say, and the rest I think you know, Mrs. Finch, your son was a kind man who will be missed by all of us who knew him. I cry, man, I cry. I think it's pretty self-explanatory how Lewis dies. He became so absorbed in his daydream that he didn't want to live in his actual life anymore, so he took it away. We draw him in the journal and make our way out the door and up some stairs, up to Dawn's room as an adult. Edith goes on to say that on the day of Lewis's funeral, her mum told her to start packing, and that she waited until the day before they left to tell Edie. In Dawn's room, there's a little kitchen, living room, and her bedroom. There's half-packed boxes with packing peanuts everywhere, and in the end, she didn't end up bringing anything. We climb up to Edith's room, the last room in the tower. As we crawl over to her bed, Edith goes on to say, All that's left now is to tell you about that last night. We hop onto the bed, grab a quill, and start writing. As we do, we delve even deeper into the story. Also, I'll note that Edith seemed to know about Lewis's daydream. She has a little people from his imagination made out of paper in her room, along with a heap of photos. And we dive into the last night that Edith and Dawn spent in the house with Edie. It's an overhead view of them eating dinner, and Dawn and Edie get into an argument. Edie tells Edith to go find her present in the hallway. So we become Edith as a child and make our way into the secret passageway next to the library locked door. We don't see a lot of the library due to it being so dark, but in the background we can hear Edie and Dawn arguing. Edie yells that the thing they are afraid of isn't going to end when they leave the house, and that Edith has a right to know these stories, where Dawn retaliates quickly by saying her children are dead because of your stories, and that she wants to leave tonight with Edith, and a van will be there to pick up Edie in the morning. Edith end up, ends up finding the book that Edie had written for her, and it reads, Dear Edith, there's so many stories I wish I could tell you, but there's only time for one. But then we delve deeper than we ever have before, from the person on the boat, to Edith in the bedroom writing about the night, to Edith Dawn and Edie eating dinner, to Edie telling us in a book about the night Edith was born. So yeah, quite confusing. We step into Edie's shoes as she retells the tale of how the tide went way out, further out than it ever had before, and the old house was completely visible and accessible. As Edie walks towards the house, we come across a stag along the way. As we reach the gate to the old house, as Edie narrates, Edith's mother snatches the book out of her hands, and they end up tearing the book in half. It changes scenes to when Edie is in the back of her mum's car. That's when we see Edie on the front deck of the house. That was the last time she sees Edie. When the van came to pick her up the next day, Edie was already gone, presumably dead. It comes to a beautiful sequence where the subtitles float around Edith's arm as we control it out of the car window, doing wave-like motions. Edith says that they moved around a lot and that they tried to make the best of it. A new scene pops up with Edith holding a dandelion, and we can control her moving it around. The seeds float off to make the subtitles. Edith says that after the years went on that her mum started to get sick a lot. 
Then it's of Dawn's hand with a hospital name tag around her wrist, and Eva's hand reaching out towards it. She got better for a while, but then she didn't. Edith's mother was the last one. The subtitles start appearing on the screen as we make our way down what I presume to be a tunnel towards a bright light. Pretty sure we all know what this is meant to represent. Edith goes on to say how she was the last finch left alive until she found out about her baby. Maybe that if we lived forever we'd have some time to understand some things, but that the best we can do is just open our eyes and appreciate how strange and brief all of this is. The journal was supposed to be for the child, but that she now wishes they'd never see it. She says, I just want to meet you and tell you all of these stories myself, but I guess if you're reading this now, things didn't work out that way. As we come to the end of the tunnel, presumably representing Edith's child's birth, we become that person at the beginning again, but now we're in the Finch family cemetery, holding the flowers and Edith's journal. Edie goes on to narrate, this is where your story begins. I'm sorry I won't be there to see it. It's a lot to ask, but I don't want you to be sad that I'm gone. I want you to be amazed that any of us ever had a chance to be here at all. Good luck, Edith. We zoom out to Edith's son placing the lilies atop Edith's tombstone. The end. Her son was all that remains of Edith Finch. <laughs> wow, if you've made it this far, you're crazy. <laughs> Let's all take a breather and make a cup of tea. How's that sound? Okay, and chat about what the heck just all happened because, yeah, a lot just happened. What do you think happened here? <laughs> do you think it was really a curse or just Edie perpetuating the novel of the curse to her children and grandchildren with such force that, that every death is overshadowed with curse this, curse that? A lot of these deaths were accidents that could have been completely avoided, from Edie ignoring Molly to letting Calvin play on a swing that overlooked a cliff, Sam posing with a not-so-dead stag, Walter accidentally being hit by a train after locking himself away for 30 years. Like, seriously, who lets their child lock themselves away for 30 years in fear and then tell a story about them in the newspaper being a mole man? Who the heck does that? And what I can tell, Edie went with that comic book writer and told them exclusive details that no one but the family would know to write. That very in poor taste story about a 16 year old. Or Sam's ex-wife leaving her one year old to drown in a bathtub. And Lewis taking his own life. That wasn't a curse. That was him. And Edith presumably dying from childbirth. Unfortunately that happens. If you believe it to be the curse then okay. But a lot of these things could have been avoided if they just took some care. The Finches were incredibly talented and ambitious people. They all set out to do their own thing and didn't let anything get in their way. And I don't think it's unfair to assume that due to that, as well as careless parenting, resulted in a lot of their deaths. Not to mention the black cloud that hung over their heads that their elders perpetuated. I think that Edith said they believed in the curse so much they made it real. It's entirely possible that they were all just clumsy. We saw how Calvin and Edith's son both had casts. I don't believe the curse is real. In the sense, there's an entity following them around, knocking them off one by one in particular ways to make them seem feasible. I believe in the curse that they made happen themselves. The placebo effect. But yeah, let me know what you think. Let me know how you feel and if you played this game or if you're going to now or this was enough for you. <laughs> but anyway, now I'm going to jump into the tour. Now in the original game, we start up at the top of this huge kind of hill place and then we make our way down towards the Edith Finch house. In this place here underneath this like fallen down tree, this is where it was meant to emulate where a car might have driven up and this is also somewhere where a deer would be spotted. And down towards this way where there's some steps. You can see here like I've tried to emulate the newspaper by putting some bits of paper down. Just kind of like roughly emulating that idea. And yeah, this is meant to be kind of the footpath through the forest. And obviously I, I would put more trees down, but for the purpose of a photo, I didn't. But yes, as we move our way through and towards the Edith Finch house, we come across this little area here where a ute sits or a truck, I guess, depending on where you're from. 
and we can see here where I've used the carved wooden statue emulating the dragon slide that Sven was making when he died. And a lot of the stuff that I use to kind of make this house are debug objects like these. I'm pretty sure that these wooden panels are actually from Strangerville. So if you go into the debug menu and you search up Strangerville and you just click enter on the search bar, you should be able to find them. But yes, we go up the steps towards the Edith Finch house and we go around this side of the house here and these were the most annoying things using these like little roofs. So there's obviously the driveway here and then there's this weird kind of ramp and I'm assuming this was like for Edie because I'm a, I think she uses a wheelchair. We go around here and this is where you in the game would peep through a hole in the fence and see a swing. And obviously we can't really see that in the Sims version because it's the Sims. Over here we see the pet cemetery some more tombstones. I put a helmet here because it was the closest thing to like a crown I could find for Lewis and a paintbrush for Milton. We see the cat for Molly, the rocket for Calvin, a saw for Sven and a book for Edie. Over here I just put a train for Walter because I couldn't really put the rock with the little peephole there symbolizing the tunnel because it, it just would have looked stupid but y'all get the idea. Here is like where I've tried to make a recreation of like Sven and Edie looking at Odin as he sinks down with the house. And here is Barbara's tombstone. And down here we have Sam, Gus and Gregory's tombstones I believe. And here we have the infamous swing. Obviously there's two of them now so twice the havoc. But if we zoom around this side you can see where I meticulously did the scaffolding. Now since the new update came out a lot of these have kind of mucked up and look a little bit less uh good <laughs> and unfortunately with this build as accurate as I could make it I couldn't actually make Walter's tunnel because it just wouldn't work and I was planning on actually putting it here but everything I tried to do just was not working and a lot of it I had to cut out. But without further ado how about we actually step a foot into the house and I think the best way to do this is actually following in Edith's footsteps as she goes into the house. So we start in the garage and in here we see the cluttered garage and funnily enough I actually I actually don't know why I decided to put more laundry stuff in here. I think it just looked good, but there's actually already a laundry in this build and it's in the basement. <sighs> Anyway, let's make our way into the kitchen and I'm pretty proud of this kitchen over here was kind of annoying But I did my best. It's actually meant to like come as a curve across like here and we got these snail can things that are meant to um, represent Ew, I meant to represent uh, Lewis's cans from the cannery But I've just put every little detail I could in this kitchen and I also placed the Microwave on top of a counter that I've sized down and hidden because it sits on some kind of like cabinet and over here there was a blue or a light blue a wood fire stove and so I just put another one there but then we walk into the dining room and obviously it's a bit of a mess so yeah the last night they spent they were eating Chinese I believe so I put some boxes there you know the generic Chinese food kind of look I definitely did take some liberties with this house because you know there's only so much you can really do but yes this is probably my favorite room in the whole house because that chimney and the secret to what I did here was I went into the debug menu and found these like packages that are unlabeled and I just made them kind of look like the bricks and some ruins as well I actually wasn't going to do the broken fireplace as a thing you know it's so iconic how could I not do that anyway <laughs> But we'll move down the hallway and to the entranceway. Yes, you see it here. We have our little tiny music box um, where you get the key to unlock the basement door. And towards the entrance. Here I've just used some pink gems to like emulate the packing peanuts and little details. And there was a little shelf here with all the envelopes for every family member. And over here we have the trademark library door. And I know that I haven't actually like put a border across every single door and that's because I actually wanted your sims to be able to use most of the doors because I know a lot of people would want to use this house but I think it is mostly functional but please don't hate me if it's not. It is honestly a very much just aesthetic build. And here we have the broken railing that's been 
patched together again. I won't lie, this is probably my favorite part of the house. I don't know what it is about these like cute little details, obviously not a cute part of the story, but cute little details like that that make the house. And this curved little piece of shelving here. And of course, I've gotten a lot of comments about this already. Um, the wine cabinet that is actually a crawl space. And here I've just used pieces of debug timber to like, you know, emulate that kind of curve around staircase. And some wooden planks, I think, that are from Jungle Adventure? I'm probably wrong, because Edith's mom ends up locking up the third floor. But from what I can tell, we end up going into Walter's room, which is this way. And I'm not very proud of this room. <laughs> this one was really difficult to do. So a lot of this kind of just has to do with you connecting the dots and making the idea happen. Obviously the train here is meant to resemble the big train mural that we have here. And here's the book that we find the lock in. Under the ocean painting plus house. That's pretty much uh, my reasoning for this. I wish we had more murals or like decals. And then of course we go through our first hidey hole and in it we do see a little like bas uh, bassinet or carriage for a little teddy bear and a, a tea set and I think a little bookshelf. And yes, the black cats. I've put a lot of little black paintings and decals everywhere just to um, signify w Milton and him doing his little adventures throughout the house. But we go through here and we come to Molly's room. Molly had a lot of like branches hanging from a ceiling. Like I think she's the kind of kid that would go rough it. She'd go out into the yard. And here this is obviously meant to represent the castle that she draws on the wall. And over here we have the little pumpkin to signify her little pumpkin candy jar thingy that she has from Halloween. And here I think is probably one of my other favorite parts in the build. I've tried to make a gerbil cage and I know it's pretty crap, but I still love it. I think it's very cute. And over here we find her little kind of creative nook, I think. And the annoying thing is some things have disappeared since the update. I put, her I put a journal there for her and obviously I put the chalkboard there where she drew the sea creature, the sea monster. And down here is the starfish that she was dissecting. As we do, we crawl through the window and zoom over to Edie's bedroom. And in we go. I'm pretty sure these are like fish crates or something like you'd catch animals in, but they were the closest things I could get to bird cages. And Edie keeps a lot of bird cages with their portraits in them and their death and birth dates. Because as we know, Edie loves memorializing the dead. Over here, she had a couple um, mannequin heads with hats on them, I think. Maybe she made hats in her day. This is meant to represent the mole man. Um, newspaper clipping and over here we have Sven's corner once again with a newspaper cli clipping and the branches that she has laid there for him and we move away over here and I think this would be Edie's section. Big glorious section it has way more pictures than this and I think she has a scimitar I think it's called up here. She has a little miniature of the house here as well and over here we see Lewis's portrait being painted and as you can see here I've used the wooden plates from Dine Out to represent the pieces of wood that Sven's cut and Edie's uh, turned into her canvases for the portraits. And here we have kind of like her oxygen tank I guess. You get the gist, you know what I mean. <laughs> and we'll go into the pink bathroom. Yeah, so I thought I actually got rid of the pink rug because I detested it so much. But yes, I also didn't forget the chair in the shower. I could never forget that. You know, it's very important that they don't slip and fall. And the shelf has disappeared from here. But anyway, we hop through here. And this is where Sven would have his pictures in here. Maybe I could have put some photos in here. That probably would have been a good idea. But anyway, and we go through the secret passageway once again with a little black cat painting and through this little doggy door. But in we come to Sam and Calvin's room, and I'm pretty proud of this room. I think I did a decent job. Here is Sam's part of the room, obviously very military influenced, and he's little cubby areas. From memory, um, they, he has ladders on either side, and then we go up to Calvin's area, we have a full on bridge. Obviously, I've put a lot of like rocket and space memorabilia all around the room. This kid loved the idea of becoming an astronaut. And I know there's nothing on the actual bridge, but you know, I like putting in a little extra detail when I can. But 
that extra detail I did there I should have put here. I'm kind of kicking myself that I didn't put like maybe a gate here to symbolize like that window the command center has. I use this little awning here to represent his helmet and obviously I've used these kind of books to represent what Sam has written about his brother and then we move down here and you will find another secret passageway and this is behind the wine cabinet and as we move through here we can climb back through and into the hallway. No it is not functional maybe it is for cats and dogs but I wouldn't you know stretch that far <laughs> but we'll move back through down here and then here we are in Barbara's room in the trunk and yes I did put that little pumpkin drawing that Milton did this part of the room I'm not proud of like I feel free to call it bad I'm not very proud of this section I didn't have enough room but you can see here I've tried to make her little awards area here as well as the one next to it I think she has her photo here and over here is where she's been memorialized by Edie and here is her bedroom very cluttered obviously a heck load of books and stuff on the shelves a typewriter and she has a cake here I think in a box closest as I could get was a pizza box I found popcorn and I put it here in a bucket to make it look like the popcorn had spilled over I love that little detail I'm pretty happy about that she actually also has a pink cat clock here like that traditional cat clock with the eyes moving backwards and forwards with its tail and you know I found the pinkest clock I could and I just put a cat there and I will say it was really kind of difficult finding the proper layout for all these places it took me so so long trying to get them all like I said I spent 14 hours recreating this house I'm not sure how long I spent off camera doing it all but I know it definitely took a lot overall and even today when I was just mucking around Around getting ready to film I was like oh no I should have done this or I should have done that and I was just kicking myself you know but when we're finished with Barbara's room we go down to the basement and here we are this this is meant to represent a pool table we don't have a pool table in the sims like previous editions just a little bit salty it's okay and this is actually where the laundry sits so you know with a house this big you'd want two laundries anyway geez but then we go through here and we find Sven's little work area and I'm kind of kicking myself I didn't use those wooden plates again because like I said before he's like mass produced those wooden canvases for Edie so you know feel free to add those in but yes we'll move down through here and we go to the fridge and no this fridge is not a door but you can just pretend and in here we have the walkway down to Walter's part of the house we have here the room where he keeps all his preserves and gear and all stuff like that and into this room is the bunker itself yes a lot of uh, BB dot move objects happened in this portion over here there was actually his shower section and I could see that he had a dish rack down there so he was clearly washing his dishes in there which is peculiar because you also see a sink so what I'm assuming is that that was broken this took me a long time to do once again using that size down counter to make it face this way and over here we can see where Walter was playing around with his train model set and his bookshelves over here and his bunk bed and over here I've gotten these like chili jars that are orange to represent the peaches that he eats every single day and the calendar that he always looks at and here we have kind of his little seating area where he'd sit and read his books I presume and yes I did put a little photo here for a faux background and and unfortunately no this does not go anywhere but this was the closest I could kind of get to a trapdoor oh yeah how funny was it that somebody thought this house was Minecraft and the funniest part is actually I love Minecraft I got it like last week and I have just become like newly addicted it's insane and uh, yeah that's probably why I have a few ideas for builds in the future so if you see some pretty odd builds coming your way Minecraft inspired that would be why <laughs> but yeah they really need to do their fact checking more thankfully that wasn't the actual journalist I was working with that was actually a totally different freelance um, journalist that had found my piece from somewhere else and decided to redo it but how could you think that this was Minecraft I mean seriously look at the trees Anyway, no hard feelings. I thought it was pretty funny. After we go through there, we know that we go to the beach and then to the graveyard or the cemetery and then up to Sam's room. So let's go in. This I also did some creative liberties with. This desk is meant to be along this wall here, but you know, you get the gist. <laughs> and once again, obviously very military inspired, but we also have a lot of like real life photos because Sam was a photographer. And over here, I've used the TV to be placed inside that 
that old fashioned record player to give that old timey TV representation. He's got his tripod here and this is where his um, medals were and I don't, I thought we could place some medals inside here. Obviously I was wrong. So over here is where he wrote a letter I believe and was the box for Kay, his ex-wife. And I guess a lot of people are probably wondering what's behind this door. You don't see this in the game at all. I actually just kind of guessed that at the top of this locked up staircase, I guess there would be a hallway between the kids' bedroom and Sam's. And yes, I did put in a bathroom here. I'm not sure if it's the bathroom Gregory was in because I'm pretty sure Kay was like being called from Sam from the Finch house, but you never know. Back in Sam's room, we'll go through the secret passageway. And then here we find a lot of toys from Gregory and Dawn and Gus. Um, a little bit of graffiti from Milton and through here we have the kids bedroom. This I like to think I did a decent job of. On the floor we have some car blue carpet with some lily pads and I sized up some Lego kind of bricks to form that little castle that he has. And in here we have little dear Gregory's monument. Man that part's so sad and this part was Dawn's and I've used some planks to kind of make a empty bed with no mattress and here is Gus's. And I've used those those ship wheels to kind of make the string holder thingy. I don't know what it's called, guys. I'm sorry. Lockers and the escape plan, which I'm assuming Sam would have done. And up here we actually have Dawn's little section, which I'm assuming was when she was a teenager. And there's the rock climbing wall that she uses. How cool of a place to have that, though. I'm just wondering, like, how annoying it'd be to get up there with, like, a laptop or food or anything. I totally have like a little mini pulley system. Pretty damn sure this part of the house is not usable whatsoever. There's a little TV and over here is her computer area and I've used a lot of clutter items up here and I believe these rugs are from Strangerville and yes you can see them from the bottom and they don't go weird like normal rugs would do if you tried to scroll them up and then I just used some shelves to add a little bit more thickness to it because a lot of the items were popping through the rug. But yeah, let's go through this little door and this door is actually meant to be above Dawn's bed But it wasn't looking quite right and we zoom up here and this part is another favorite of mine Whoa, this is obviously the little gardens that Lewis Milton and Edith had and I think they're super cute I've just used some like bedside tables here and over here We just have that seating area with a lot of fairy lights and up there we have Lewis's room in here we have the classroom and this room was really cute. I actually really liked it and it was kind of a happy part of the story where things were okay and things were looking up. I especially liked putting all the stuff on the walls. I've probably never used these decals before but I was like nah I gotta use them. But let's go through here and as a thing like awesome as castle idea I would have loved this as a kid but this place was like right next to the sea. I'm so surprised Milton didn't like just fly away you know. But we'll go through his window here and into his bedroom we are. And obviously you cannot use this. I don't even think there's a bed in here. But it's just meant to represent his bed in the game. Which is pretty much just a mattress that has been placed and filled in into the wall. And like it looks cozy af. Here we have another painting station of his and the ship that's on his shelf. And then we have this little pulley system that pulls us up to the art area. Stop glitching! Okay, from a distance... We can see here, this is where Milton was memorialized by Edie. I have no idea how the heck she managed to get up here. And obviously another little painting area. This is where his little flip book probably sat. I know obviously I put things kind of in the wrong place, but I kind of just had to make things fit in this area. But we'll just zoom over here to Lewis's side of the house. And here we are. I love this room a lot. I used a lot of these like glowy lights and ooh, that's annoying. <laughs> This is what happens when you mess around with room placement. Anyway, just ignore the lovely skylight. Here we have Lewis's bed and his microwave that he has sitting behind his bed. And we've got his mini fridge, his TV and his high school diploma. And his incense? Yeah. Over here we have his computer station and he uses a huge bouncy ball or like yoga ball, fitness ball for his seat and honestly that'd be the most annoying thing but at the same point I could see how it'd be hella comfy. And we have that little letter here from his psychiatrist, his headphones, his mugs, his CDs, his phone and his monitors but we'll go right around, turn back and go up the stairs. Here we come to the second last floor. And this is Dawn's room. And Dawn's area is so damn dark, it was so hard to see. 
and a little bit difficult to map out to be honest. I'm pretty sure this isn't where the staircase is at all. I can't actually remember, it's been a little while since I've played the actual game. But over here we can see where she was packing the boxes, getting ready to move, but obviously she didn't end up bringing anything. And then we'll go up to Edith's room. <coughs> Do not recommend zooming around in Tab Moon at these heights. It's so annoying. <laughs> And here is Edie's room and the tab mode is going really fast at the moment so I'm sorry if I'm making anyone sick. Pretty much her room is kind of like that staple stereotypical pinky purpley colours and I'm all for it. I think it looks gorgeous and she kind of looks like she has a wabbit tablet actually on her bed like some pink tablet which is really cool. I put her little quill here for her journal where she ends up writing to her son and then we zoom around here and we have all the books. And the interesting thing about the books in her bedroom is that they're all color coordinated and they don't have any labels. And I'm just wondering, did she like redo them all herself or is there like some really cool Easter egg behind that? I'd really like to know what that is. I'm probably looking into it a bit too much. I think it looks cool. But there we have it. We have Edie's room and that means we only have one room left. The library. Now, we barely even get to see the library, really, because it's all dark and there's barely anything to be seen because there's no power. So I kind of just went nuts with this part. I just thought I could just remember going over to this little section here and I have a million photos of this little section trying to get it correct. But that is meant to be the journal from Edie to Edith and the typewriter next to it. But with the rest, I've just put in a big library and what I pictured the Finches would have in it. A lot of awards, a lot of books everywhere, something massive like maybe this is meant to represent Orcas Island, just bits and bobs that they've probably found along the way. But yeah, nothing too special I guess about this library. But either way, I hope you think it suits and it's fitting for the house. And I think that's pretty much all I have to show you guys. And if I have forgotten anything, how about you just download it yourself and give yourself the tour? Because honestly, it is really fun walking through this house in The Sims. I believe some of the secret passageways can be usable. You just have to move stuff around. Obviously, a lot of it is for aesthetics. But I would also like to take this part to thank all of the new subscribers. I'm pretty sure it went from around 800 to 1000 in like two days so that's pretty insane so hello everyone that's new to the channel i hope you enjoy this video and you stick around for more but yeah i guess this is the part where i tell you to subscribe even though you already know that that's an option but yeah feel free to like and share and if you like this house feel free to download it i'm jess hearts like my youtube channel name on origin and you can find it on the sims 4 gallery online as well and the article for this build shall be out next week I have been told so get ready for that as well I'm super excited there's a lot of behind the scenes in that that isn't in this video so you've got even more stuff there if you'd like but thank you all for coming and watching my video I hope you guys enjoy this video and I'll see you guys in the next one bye <laughs>